everyone, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to be here and share some uh, perspectives on augmented reality and virtual reality in plastic surgery. I'm going to talk a bit about the um, what is the reality spectrum to help you understand the differences between some of the terms used in uh, augmented and virtual reality. Uh, I'll discuss a bit about the hardware. Uh, I'll show you some of the applications of this kind of technology. And then I'll, um, I'm going to show everybody a live demo of, of some of the toys that I have with me. So the history of augmented and virtual reality starts a couple hundred years ago in the 1800s where a French painter uh, by the name of Franz Robot created these immersive 360 degree murals. The point of which was when the observer comes into a room with this huge painting, they suddenly feel like they're immersed in the environment and they no longer have any other point of reference except for the painting. That was one of the first sort of applications of creating an environment where somebody's completely immersed and essentially it's a virtual reality. This technology progressed slowly but surely uh, and the next step was creating a stereo, the concept of a stereoscope where two similar images are placed together through a lens and combined to the user, it creates depth perception. The first story, however, of virtual reality comes in sci-fi, uh, also in the 1800s. And in this story, it's a very futuristic perspective of how virtual reality was this set of liquid goggles that you would put on. It would somehow transport you to a different dimension and give you a different perspective of reality. It's kind of interesting seeing how virtual reality has evolved since then from the original sci-fi story. Throughout the years, virtual reality technologies, augmented reality technologies have slowly evolved to go from extremely cumbersome, uh, not portable at all pieces of hardware to the more commonplace things that we see today. The spectrum of reality is important to understand when talking about this technology because there really sit on a spectrum from what we see in regular life, which is reality, what we're all seeing right now. And then in the middle, you have augmented reality. So your field of vision, plus some s sort of hardware or uh, enhanced vision that allows you to see what you're seeing, plus data on top of that. And then finally, virtual reality, which is a completely synthesized image that immerses you and has nothing necessarily to do with your surroundings. So this whole genre is called mixed reality, reality, augmented, and virtual reality. But ultimately, any kind of mixed reality uh, technology needs an onboard computer that can take information from your outside environment, process it, and then change it on a visual display that's presented back to you. So virtual reality is, uh, uh, like I said, completely immersive, and the technologies available are not as different from each other as they are in the augmented reality setup. So the technologies I have shown here are the three leading companies in the virtual reality space. The bottom left is the HTC Vive, the top is the Oculus Rift, and the bottom right is the Samsung Gear. Um, they each have slightly di uh, different features, but the key important things are that the entire visual field of the user is taken over by an image, and your head is tracked and moves in space. So when you turn your head around, the image not only moves with you, but you see a wider, wider field of view, the same you would in, vert, in regular reality. Right now, I can't see what's behind me, but when I turn, it becomes apparent. Augmented reality technologies are a little bit more diverse. There's different kinds of AR, and I'll tell you about them. So the first kind of augmented reality that we've seen many times is spatial augmented reality. So when you've, if you've ever seen projection mapping on a building that makes it move and look pretty, that's actually augmented reality, using an existing structure with a projection map on top. Here are some other examples the Sydney Opera House, another building that's moving and, and changing shapes. Handheld augmented reality has become increasingly popular um, through gaming. So if anyone has ever seen or heard of Pokemon Go, that is what put augmented reality on the map. Um, so you have a handheld device that has a video input, it changes and plays with the image, and then presents it to you on a screen. Not available yet on the market, but uh, there's different companies in the space developing a contact lens form of augmented reality. So again, there's a processing uh, unit all within the small contact lens that has a, a, a way to present you a, an image. Also a little bit secretive is the, uh, the concept of virtual retina display. So if anyone has ever heard of a company called Magic Leap, um, they are creating a uh, headwear display that projects directly onto the retina. So instead of your eye looking at something and understanding the image, it's projected directly onto the back of the retina to take over your entire field of view. 
The technology that I'm going to show you today is the augmented reality of a head mount style. So you're wearing a, a basically a computer and a screen on your head and your eyes are looking out and the concept of depth perception is created using uh, a mix of the mirrors and, and uh, the hardware. The common ones that you've probably heard about are Google Glass and Meta. Today I'll give you a demonstration of the HoloLens, which I think is um, uh, a, a bit further ahead in terms of the development of this technology. Uh, it's currently on the market. It costs $3,000. It's more in the developer stage now um, in terms of uh, development of apps and different applications across a wide variety of fields. But I think the applications to medicine are particularly interesting, specifically within plastic surgery. Um, so the device, just basic geeky specs, it lasts about two to three hours on one charge. It weighs approximately uh, 895 grams. Um, and has 64 gigabytes of RAM for storage. It's a completely standalone device, meaning you don't need a computer to operate it, but there's a lot of apps that you can use to interact with your computer. So very briefly before I get to the demo, I'd like to tell you about some applications uh, within surgery of using this kind of technology. So the most obvious is surgical education. Um, having the ability to, to record um, and have a point of view perspective is very useful creating training libraries for residents and teaching students as well as um, you know, interacting with data in, uh, in a live setting. Furthermore, being able to call up anatomical diagrams and markings in the middle of a surgery is a huge benefit. I can't re remember how many times I've tried to remember exact anatomical diagrams in my head when it would have been amazing to, have, uh, to pull up a diagram of netters right there live in the operating room. Also for surgical education and simulation outside of the operating room in the teaching setting. This is a, a little snapshot of the demo I'm going to give you, but to create um, a 3D immersive environment where you can walk around and interact with whatever structures, uh, anatomical markings, um, which is far superior to sitting with a two-dimensional page. Um, just for fun, this is a, a preview of surgical simulation. This is a game, but uh, the, the ability to use virtual reality in surgical simulation is powerful because um, you can minimize risks uh, to patient exposure in a, in a less experienced setting. And some applications in plastic surgery um, include uh, demonstrating the complex underlying anatomy of a cleft lip and palate and also teaching principles and skills of microsurgery. A really powerful application of augmented reality is in telemedicine. The more uh, sophisticated and connected the technology we have becomes, the easier it is to call upon somebody from a remote site who might have more experience to have uh, advice to give on a certain situation. So you can imagine a setting where a resident is on call in the emergency room and calls their attending staff, they have a complete visual field connection of what's going on, and the, suddenly the expert surgeon is in the environment far more than they would be by communicating by text, phone, um, through photos. One example of how this telemedicine feature works is uh, through this technology called, called VIPAR, V-I-P-A-A-R. Um, so on the left hand of the screen you have what a surgeon would see from a surgeon's perspective and if they want to call in help or you know call a friend from home they contact uh, through a wireless link through their augmented reality headset a surgeon at a different site who's not there but can also see their field of vision. That person at the other site on the bottom right of the screen, can then put an object into the visual field that they're holographically seeing, and now provide the mixed reality image, which you see in the middle, which is uh, two surgeons at different locations interacting to discuss uh, you know, principles or, or steps of a surgery. Another application is data overlay and integrating patient uh, information in real time uh, in a clinical setting. So calling up diagrams, patient charts, um, patient imaging, um, all extremely useful in, a, in, a, in the direct uh, patient encounter. Here's just an example of what I was discussing before, so the handheld augmented reality in the actual clinical setting, so understanding the underlying vascular anatomy of the liver, for example, when doing a, a liver a, a surgery near the liver. One of the other applications is also in the consultation setting. So a company uh, by the name of Illusio has developed an augmented reality platform that allows patients to see what they look like in real time in the post-operative setting. Similar to how the vector functions to augment features of the patient, but that's done a little bit it, there's a bit of lag there because you take the picture and then you physically change it. This is in real time. Also useful in the perioperative setting. Um, this is an example of measuring intracanthal distance after oculoplasty. It's a very, very simple, just straight lines on an iPhone and allowing to uh, compare distances there. So ultimately, all of these technologies are coming together to create this concept of cyber care. How does the patient view the doctor and how does the doctor view the patient as these technologies come into play? Could we see a place where both patient and doctor are wearing some sort of augmented reality headset and interact in a completely different way than they, they, uh, they have previously? So on that note, I'd like to show you the HoloLens. Um, and it, just give me a minute to put it on and get it set up. Okay.
So what you can see now is, um, can everybody see okay? All right. I now have the opportunity to put a hologram that I can interact with anywhere in three-dimensional space. So what I've done is, before everybody arrived, I started to take the opportunity to put a few things that are around here, and I can show you how I can interact with them. So, this is just for fun, but I've put some things here that you can see that are floating and interesting, and I can appreciate them in real time in, in a really multi-dimensional setting. They didn't know this, but I've put this, uh, this little tree and lake setting here. You must think I'm crazy because you can't see what I'm talking about, right? Over here, a little fireplace. Can you guys see? Let me connect it again. Anyway, that's the fun uh, toy part of it, but let's talk about some real medical applications. So um, let's say I'm in the surgical setting. And the importance of creating preoperative x-rays to have available to interact with. Is everybody still seeing that? Yeah. Okay. So imagine I'm in a surgical setting and I, I want to reassess uh, the details of a, a patient's fracture while in the OR and I don't want to um, unscrub, I don't want to break my field of view. And you can see I haven't touched anything yet, so I'm still fully scrubbed technically. Um, or for example, uh, you know, I want to pull up somebody's anatomy or just remember a certain diagram in Netter. So I can, in real time, take and manipulate these images and, and have a look. So you can start to see that there's a real strong immersive component. Um, usually doesn't lag this much, but the more kind of interaction you have with cellular interference, obviously that's, a, that's an issue. Um, one really important application, I think, is the potential for surgical education, and I'd like to show you a demo. Augmented reality can help with anatomic study. It allows the learner to use high-resolution holograms to study bony structures, vessels, muscle groups, and even complex facial anatomy. This is an example of a student reviewing anatomy in an on-call room with a high-resolution hologram. This hologram can be shared amongst a group of students, all wishing to partake in anatomical teaching. Holograms can be customized to fit the needs of the learner. So I have that full anatomical surgery app running in this setting, but I still have all these other features that I can exit and co come out and interact with. So I apologize for the little bit of lagging. Like I said, uh, in the right setting with the right connection, you have a much more immersive environment. Um, yesterday I did it in an area where there was actually not much wireless interference and it was working pretty well. Um, so transitioning out of the HoloLens, I want to show you one other technology, but now from not from the surgeon's augmented reality perspective, but from a patient care perspective. That was augmented reality. Now this is a virtual reality application. So one way, uh, an interesting uh, company that's been exploring the use of virtual reality to decrease perioperative anxiety and pain is Applied VR. Now what Applied VR has done is create a immersive virtual reality uh, interactive software where a patient, for example, a child who's getting a burn dressing change or removal of a cast, basically any kind of uh, high anxiety, high pain situation, they can put on this headset, fully visual and audio immersive, and they're distracted. So there's a decreased sensitivity to pain. This uses the principle of the gate control theory where overstimulation of another sense can help decrease the activity of pain sensation. So to demo this technology, um, Alex is gonna help me out here. And I'm going to show you what she's going to be seeing in real time through this kind of immersive game slash uh, interactive environment. So um, there's different uh, applications of that kind of software. There's a, a, a game setting where, you know, the child picture, you know, if you've ever seen a, a child have a burn dressing change, it can be incredibly painful and they have to usually be sedated. But in this setting, they put on this little headset with goggles. They're involved in a game that's fully immersive and interactive which is better than just a regular video game because they can still see in uh, their peripheral environment. But here, this fully immersive setting changes their perspective to the point where um, studies have been done to show decreased uh, need of sedation and pain medication. 
This is just another example of a similar kind of game where instead of shooting bears with a gun and a cannon, uh, it's snowballs in a different setting. So you can imagine the merging of this kind of gaming interactive software with the ability uh, to decrease post-operative or perioperative pain anxiety could be really powerful. This could also have an application outside of pediatrics in a more uh, uh, minor or elective surgery center where patients don't, aren't asleep during procedures, perhaps in the cosmetic setting, and undergoing uh, either needling or uh, other minimally invasive procedures where they are still present in the environment. And if they have any level of anxiety, um, it could be greatly decreased by sort of allowing them, finding them a, a helpful way to relax. This is an example of a guided meditation. So there's music playing and there's things moving around you and you can explore your environment um, all while having a, a procedure done to you. Thanks, Alex. So any new technology is not without its limitations and I think it's important to, to mention the three major ones that I find with, uh, with this upcoming technology. The first is HIPAA compliance. So any company in the space um, that plans to enter the medical area with virtual and augmented reality technology needs to uh, create a, a data encrypted way and there's companies working in the space to help uh, all the augmented reality tech. Also the element of distraction is important. So if you're operating and your reaction time is decreased or awareness is decreased because you're wearing a headset, that's, that's a significant concern. And finally, just because it's shiny, new and interesting doesn't mean it's a cost effective innovation. There needs to be um, a cost effective way to apply it and justify the expensive cost. Overall, I think augmented and virtual reality will continue to make its way into the medical setting uh, and the surgical setting, but as costs decrease and more resources and, and interesting utilizations are found, it'll become more applicable. Some of the next steps are to incorporate uh, real-time tracking analysis, 3D software in, uh, for surgical planning. I mean, imagine doing a preoperative marking without ever using a pen. You just wear a headset that marks it in real time and keeps track of where the patient is. I think the biggest play for the future of augmented reality and virtual reality is actually the merging of the concept of big data and augmented reality. So this paper uh, highlights the ability of a computer algorithm with time and exposure to hours and hours of surgical videos to understand, like, understand what's happening in the video. And I mean specifically understanding surgical steps. This motion is cauterizing, this motion is suturing, this motion is ligation, this motion is anastomosis. So if a computer can understand the steps of a surgery in real time with an onboard camera, it becomes a powerful utility to change a whole number of things. For example, if a computer can understand the steps of a surgery, it can then replace the need to dictate it afterwards because it knows what happened. So in summary, an, an augmented reality device needs to be one that can integrate patient data in real time it should enhance consultations uh, for the patient as well as uh, the, the care provider. Um, it should really be an immersive setting that makes surgical education more interesting and appealing than just the traditional 2D images. And then it needs to really synthesize uh, the collection of, of what's happening around the patient. So just to take you back from where we started, the story of the Pygmalion Spectacles. I thought it was uh, interesting, one line from that story, it reads as follows. Of course, nobody knows anything. You just see what information you can get through the windows of your five senses, and then you make your guesses. When they're wrong, you pay the penalty. So even though we all rely on our five senses constantly, the fact that there's a technology out there that can enhance that is a significant thing to think about if used in the right setting to avoid whatever mistakes we might be making or things we don't have access to because we're not enhancing our senses. Thank you very much.